This week on Information Technology Leaders, Scott Griffin, the Chief Information Officer of the Boeing Company. Now here's our host, Laura Schilkraut. Today's guest is the Chief Information Officer of the Boeing Company. Students often ask me what it takes to be an executive, not just a senior person, but a true executive. Is it as simple as having had sufficient experience and good judgment to adopt the right lessons? They sense it must be something more, and I agree. However, it's hard to define. But every now and then, I get to witness it. Several months ago, I was at a meeting of our e-business programs advisory board, where our guest is the chairman of the curriculum committee. A lengthy brainstorming discussion took place where the board members described what they expected the students of this program would have learned. There were a range of comments, all relevant, but the discussion itself, as are all brainstorming sessions, was random and unfocused. As the comments wound down, without missing a beat, he summarized the 30-minute discussion in 15 seconds by defining five continuums, which thoroughly represented all of the feedback we just received. That level of clear articulation is one of the traits that makes a true executive. And then I remembered that he'd agreed to be one of our interviewed guests, and I found myself smiling. Please welcome Scott Griffin. Thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Fresno, California, which is the, uh, the middle of the San Joaquin Valley. And the reason people know where it is is because it's on the way to Disneyland from, uh, from Washington. So. so was growing up like Disneyland? Uh, not exactly, although um, Walt Disney uh, got involved in focus groups uh, early in the 50s. And actually, I was in a focus group for Disney. He was looking for um, a geography that that represented middle America and he picked mm -hmm. Fresno because they just had to get on Highway 99 and drive north uh, three and a half hours. So I was somewhat traumatized as a kid <laughs> because we watched the movies over and over again and I was the youngest uh, person and they always tried to make it interesting for 13 year olds mm -hmm. and not make the youngest person cry and I did a lot of crying. So <laughs> uh, actually it was kind of like Disneyland. Yeah, as a I guess so. Sp speaking of all that crying, what were you like in high school? Well, um, in high school, I guess I was, um, I played baseball. I wanted to play uh, football, but I broke all the toes on one foot. Oh. So uh, I wouldn't say I was uh, a klutz, but uh, probably a say? little bit of an, of, of an egghead, you know, <laughs> of, of uh, hanging out with uh, students that studied uh, more than was healthy, I guess. I'm not <laughs> sure if that's correct or not. I don't know. We, sh we should have talked to one of my uh, high school buddies and right. found out. Yeah, I've gotten some good stories yeah, from that. My high school buddy's not here today, <laughs> I hope. Where did you go to college? I went to Fresno State uh, University, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, right there in, in Fresno. Mm -hmm. uh, Fresno State's not famous for very much. It's an agricultural school. It does have a good, good business school uh, and good law school. So, mm -hmm. Is that what made you decide to go there? Uh, I went there because uh, it was uh, local, and uh, you know Fresno was a great place to be from. Great weather, uh, you could get some fun places from Fresno. Hint, hint. Uh, you could get to Yosemite to you know to ski. You could get to Carmel to the beach. You could drive to San Francisco for the theater or Los Angeles. So I liked being from there, and, and Fresno State was a good good college. I enjoyed it. You also worked your way through school. What were some of the jobs that you held during college? Well, my dad was in the agriculture business. Everybody in Fresno is in agriculture, unless you're a banker or a lawyer. And uh, I started driving trucks. So I was actually a, a Teamster truck driver. And I did that for about five years and drove um, over the grapevine to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. This is a real scary thing for truck drivers because the truck wants to go faster than you want it to go. Uh, and my first year out of high school, actually, I had a chance to become a firefighter and started actually carrying a shovel or, a, or an axe and kind of worked my way up uh, in the firefighting hierarchy where I was a, um, I had a, a sector, you know, a little group of, of folks and I had a bigger crew. Uh, it was really fun educational work. We got to hire the, the firefighters ourselves. Uh, we got to train them ourselves. I got to fight fires all over western United States. It was really a kick in the pants. While you were doing that, you were really given the opportunity to learn the difference between being reactive and proactive. 
Can you talk a little bit about the circumstances behind that? Yeah, you know, I didn't think about that till later. Uh, Boeing is pl places a high value on mentor relationships, having two or three people who have who who know more than you do, basically, mm -hmm. who can counsel you and coach you and give you feedback, tough feedback if necessary. So uh, one of the one of my mentors and I actually spent some time talking to people who had executive potential, kind of got on the circuit for a while. We talked about career planning. And I realized that firefighting shifted from the early 1900s. Um, you know, you had smoke jumpers, kind of like in the movie where you jump out of an airplane with a big heavy pack, um, where it was reactive, where if there was a fire, you raced to the fire and put it out. And it moved to becoming much more proactive. They call it um, forest management, where you cut spots for helicopters to land. You actually cut the trails before the fire started. And the, the way that you put out a fire is to really burn it back into itself. And all the hard work is cutting the trails. Mm -hmm. The lighting of the fires is really kind of fun. You use napalm, you know. But um, you know, I started thinking about the, the proactive part of that. That was pretty good training for being a manager mm -hmm. where instead of waiting for the fire to start, instead of jumping in with a 100-pound pack, instead of uh, rushing to put out fires and be, being reactive, and by the way, there are people who are professional at putting out fires. You really want to think about what could happen mm -hmm. and, and do some preparation. So um, I, in retrospect, it was fantastic training. At the time, I didn't quite catch the significance right. of it. I was going to college and having fun and making really good money you know, paying for school. So it was a great experience, really yeah. fun. Yeah, it's one of those things that you can look back on and realize how much you learn, but you almost don't appreciate the, the lesson. At the as time, you go it was it. exhilarating. I got to fly in helicopters. Uh, I did not, um, uh, you know, I, I was not part of the service. I did not have to go to Vietnam as many of my colleagues uh, in my age group did. I was a little bit too young for that. So for me, flying on helicopters was a thrill. Mm -hmm. For some of the people who fought forest fires, it wasn't quite as much fun yeah. as you know for, mm -hmm. for me. But man, I love airplanes, I love flight, I love helicopters. I, I just had a blast. Carried shotgun shells with napalm in them and a you know, short shotgun on my leg. And I wasn't really thinking about my mm -hmm. career. I was thinking about making enough money to pay for the next year of school. So. Well, speaking about not thinking about your career, yeah. uh, after college, I assume that most of your friends were actively seeking employment, but you decided to take a different path. Could you tell us about that? Sure. My wife and I uh, got married in 1976, and we knew that we did not want to live in Fresno. And uh, we knew it was a big world. Both of us had traveled in college. As a matter of fact, um, before we re really we were an item, we traveled around the world with, uh, uh, with a group of students connected with San Jose State University. And so I knew that Fresno was not the center of the universe, not even close, and that there was a big world out there. So um, kind of against the advice of our friends who were all buying houses uh, and, and getting real jobs, uh, we packed up our stuff and took off around the country. We took a map of North America. We circled every city we ever wanted to go to. And I wanted to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, so you know mm -hmm. we circled that. And we did the touristy stuff, um, but we also, our intention was to figure out where we wanted to live. And we were really open in terms of what, what job mm -hmm. you know, we would be willing to do. And in the back of our minds, we thought, you know, it'd be nice to give something uh, and not just to jump right into a career, which was a little bit counter culture as well. So we ended up in Everett, Washington as house parents uh, in a home for teenage girls who had been thrown out of foster care. And the state gave them one more chance. It was called McChesney's Home for Girls. And it was on Casino Road. And there's a 7-Eleven there now, so you can drive up there on Casino Road. When you see the 7-Eleven on the right, McChesney's Home's on the left. Is it still there? Still there. I think it's a halfway house now. At that time, it was long term. So mm -hmm. um, the, the uh, young women would come in before their 18th birthday, and then they, if, they could, if they could survive and not get kicked out, they wouldn't have to go to Juvenile Hall, which was the last alternative. Mm -hmm. So it was really fun. It was a United Way funded agency. It was great. I got to know the Boeing company before I worked there because Boeing contributes a lot to mm -hmm. United Way. Um, it was really a neat opportunity, but it was also really hard because 
we saw uh, kids who had not really had the chances that Mary and I had had. And uh, we actually saw several handfuls of kids really turn their lives around. And, and several of them are working at Boeing now, and mm -hmm. we hear from them occasionally. So it was really fun. Had nothing to do with computing, nothing to do with, uh, you know, with a career. We knew we were only going to do it for a year. As a matter of fact, they told us the average life span of a house parent was six months. And anything past six months was gravy. So we made it a year. It was really fun. I learned some words, you know, that I didn't know. I'll, I'll bet you did. Yeah. <laughs> It was neat. Probably learned some concepts it you was, didn't know either. It was a great, yeah. a great experience and really fun. Yeah. I'm glad we did it. Yeah. How did your working relationship with Boeing come about? Well, um, I really wanted to be in customer support. What I thought would be a really fun job would be to be in customer support, actually work with yeah. customers. Why and, was that so appealing? Well, um, I'm not sure. My undergraduate degree was business pre-law. So actually, I... My, my, my first intention was to be a, a mathematician, to, to teach math. Uh, by the way, on the side, I got a minor in music, which is kind of weird, but there's a lot of mathematicians mm -hmm. that study strong jazz, link, believe it yeah. or not. Link between computer programming and music Isn't also. Isn't that strange? Yeah, yeah it's very really fun. strong connection. Uh, I ended up thinking, you know, law would really be fun. That's, I had this vision, this Perry Mason uh, vision of law. Um, and I got out of school, and we decided to take a year off and kind of think about what we wanted to do. And when we were living in Everett, we got to know some folks that worked at Boeing. And the folks that were really having a kick were the folks that were working with the airlines. Mm -hmm. And um, the airlines were going through a big change in the late 70s. Um, they weren't necessarily being run by people with goggles and, you know, leather jackets, uh, but by uh, business people who were thinking about different models. So, I, you know, why, why are any of us interested in anything? I, I, I found some really neat people who talked about it like mm -hmm. they had fire in their belly. So that's what I wanted to do. That's what I, that's what I wanted to sign up for. But you didn't get into that originally. No, I got stuck at the front door. Um, <laughs> partially because of my firefighting experience where we were hiring people every year. And my last year, I think I had 120 colleagues, firefighters that were part of the crew that I was managing. Um, and we hired all those folks every year. So part, partly because I'd done some hiring uh, partly because Boeing was in this tremendous growth spurt where the 757 and 767 were both being launched at the same time. And partly because my grandfather was in sheet metal and my uncle was in composites, um, I got hired into Boeing employment. So my first job was hiring senior grade uh, tool and die makers, people that worked with exotic metals, people that could weld um, exotic metals, people that knew something about composites. and. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, uh, you know, we, you had uh, Corvette, which was a fiberglass car, but we didn't have a lot of real composites experts. It was a kick in the pants. It was a great way to get to know Boeing. Mm -hmm. I got to visit each of the sites. I got to know the different jobs. I got educated on where we were going. It was really fun. It wasn't customer support, but, um, you know, it, they pitched it as a way to get to know the company, and mm -hmm. they were absolutely right. It was fun. Well, this was sort of your first exposure to a large company. How, how yeah. did that suit you? Well, I thought it was neat. When I, when I, you know, my first six months, I decided that big companies are fun because without leaving the company, you can actually do multiple mm -hmm. things. Yeah. So um, I was kind of like a kid in a candy store. I thought, this is really neat. And, and even when I was doing the hiring, um, uh, my boss and I, uh, started working on a, a computer application that would forecast critical skills. So now here's where I started thinking about firefighting because we were basically fighting fires. Mm -hmm. um, somebody would say we need 15, you know, tool and die maker grade whatevers, and we need them yesterday. And we would we'd go to Detroit and you know go to a job away. fair and yeah. you know, stay at the Holiday Inn and. Um, you know, drink beers with tool and die makers. And uh, my boss at the time and I started thinking, wouldn't it be neat if we could actually see the tool and die openings coming up? Mm -hmm. So we actually built a little application that kind of forecasted critical skills. Mm -hmm. And those, that's back before PCs. Mm -hmm. It was before cars and electricity <laughs> and, you know, natural <laughs> gas. But there wasn't a piece, there wasn't, a, you could do that on a PC application right. now. 
But we worked with the big mainframe system with the unfriendly reports that came out on green paper. You right, know, the green bar, to, right. Yeah, yeah. Rip, burst them and rip the corners off. And um, it, it was fun. It was mm -hmm. an excellent job. And, and, and in the back of my mind, I started thinking, you know, we ought to get ahead of this curve a little mm -hmm. bit. We ought to cut the hell of spots right. before we need to fly in on the helicopters. And we ought to clear some paths before we need to, mm -hmm. you know, fire the thing off. And I was working for a real progressive boss who was, you know, one of my first mentors. So he pro it was probably his idea and he allowed me to share in to, some to of the creation the of it. Yeah. yeah. So that was sort of your first computing experience. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah. And compute back in those days, uh, computing was mysterious. Yes. And it was the purview of the computing people and real people couldn't know about computing. Right. It was like the Wizard of Oz. Someone was standing behind the curtain, you know, saying, oh, you can't come in here. This is a computer room. So, um, yeah, the system can't do that. Yes, yeah, yeah. and yeah. this is what you get. You know, right. you get green reports the way we want to slice it for mm -hmm. you. So, it was fun. It was a it was a great education in mainframe computing, and I really started as a systems analyst collecting requirements, and ended up using some of the minimal programming that I had gotten mm -hmm. in my undergraduate degree to help build some some reports. And you like doing the system analysis work? Yeah, it was great. It was great. I mean, I personality type, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an architect, big picture type. So it was fun to say, you know, what are the requirements? Hey, what would we like the world to be like? Mm -hmm. And then translate those to uh, somebody who knew more about computing than me. Mm -hmm. And it so. gave you some good exposure mm -hmm. also within the company. Yeah, that was fun. We actually got to go over to company offices, which was scary because, you know, uh, Big people work there, you know, with... Um, big important people like you are now. Big important people, well, I, I, you know, I don't, I didn't know what to think. I didn't know if they were going to eat me, you know, or... Um, but it was fun. We went over and said, you know, we, we're working on this way to forecast skills. And they said, well, yeah, what, what took you so long? You know, that's intuitively mm -hmm. obvious. Um, and yet nobody had built right. the tool, so it was kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was good exposure. And I ended up getting involved in customer services, which is mm -hmm. where I always wanted Finally. to be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, specifically, the training organization where they trained pilots and engineers, which is, they called it maintenance training. And we actually forecasted some skills for them. It was mm -hmm. really fun. So that was sort of your transition into the yeah. manager of business right. systems? Yeah. And what were your other responsibilities in that role? Well, um, I think my I, I'd had exposure to the organization because we'd gone over and said, what do we have to do to staff this thing? Mm -hmm. So you have these two new airplanes that are coming in. You have a, you're going to have a whole bunch more students. Um, I, the first thing I did, which was part of my undergraduate degree, was contract compliance. So I worked on Exhibit E, I think, of the contract, which was for spares and training. Um, I also had a bunch. I kind of had a smorgasbord, you know, of responsibilities. My first management job. So they give you everything that nobody else. Right. Because you don't know enough to say no. Right, yeah. yeah. So I got to work with governments of different countries, which was really fun. And I got to get involved in disputes of who could come and who had a visa and who had a student visa. Uh, I got involved in the computing systems, which was something that the new person always got. You know, and by the way, the, you're the computing focal. Right. Uh, which was really fun because we were just moving to... CD-ROMs, mm -hmm. you know, we, we were just playing with that at the time. And, and back then, this is when we used big um, uh, sheets of mylar and actually taped up drawings and made pictures of them and, you know, clipped them out and pasted them in black and white uh, books, which were then run millions of copies right. and run. So, so I started getting involved as we started to go to graphics and, and did maintenance publications, you know, in a more automated fashion. It was fun. It was a great first assignment. Then your second assignment was as the manager of engineering systems, and you sort of described this as your first hardcore computing area. Yeah. Did you feel technical enough to be managing those efforts? Well, um, bef just before that, I, um, I got an MBA. I started at Seattle University, and then I, my advisor ended up moving to University of Puget Sound, so I moved. And this is the time, I got my MBA in 82, and so... This was the time that computing was coming in. We used an mm -hmm. HP 3000, something that I knew something about from school, my undergraduate degree, and actually wrote some programs. I, I knew what computing could do. I didn't know how it worked. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, and so are you ever prepared for a new job? No, I was learning something every day. But I knew something about customer services and I had met the airline customers and um, I had actually gone to my boss and said, this is the kid in the candy store, and I'd really like to do something besides just this. You know, I don't see myself doing this for 25 years and retiring. So I'd like to be involved, and I, I built this little matrix that said, you know, what are the functions? Uh, Boeing at that time had commercial airplanes, defense in space, and kind of services. Um, and I uh, said, you know, I'd like to get some exposure to other parts of the company. So he really wisely sat down with me and kind of drew a map and said, you know, show me what you'd like, what you'd be interested in, and I'll kind of help you figure out how to negotiate mm -hmm. through that. So I built this little two-by-two two matrix, which I still have and really moved out of business systems into engineering systems at his advice to get some exposure to the rest mm -hmm. of the company. Was he sort of your first mentor there? Um, he was probably my second mentor. My first mentor is the one who let me participate in creating the idea that you should forecast <laughs> right. rather than react. Right. Uh, but he was a great uh, mentor and had been around training for years and was able to call someone and say, I've got this great young kid who's looking to expand his scope mm -hmm. and he does know something about computing and he's he's just finished his MBA and you know mm -hmm. take a shot. a shot and if he doesn't yeah. work we'll take him back yeah. yeah I don't know if he said that or not yeah. that's a great safety net though yeah absolutely yeah absolutely one of the things that interested me most when when you and I spoke a couple weeks ago was just how much Boeing uses IT not just to track people and to track dollars but really uses information technology in the planes and as part of the services. Can you yeah. talk about some of those projects? Sure. We, we, you know, if you think about computing in a, in a couple different ways, one of them is software applications and one of them is, is hardware delivery system infrastructure. Uh, but we also have another split of both of those categories between applications that are used to help run the business and software or delivery systems that fly away with products. Mm -hmm. So my engineering systems job was basically in the embedded software area and we had 27, 28 Boeing built computers, line replaceable, or line replaceable units, LRUs, that were on the 5.7 and 6.7 and the, the software that ran them uh, was written by Boeing people. Mm -hmm. So my first job was actually writing software that tested the software that other people mm -hmm. wrote. So this is different than applications that, right. you know, like ERP or customer uh, enterprise resource planning, customer relationship management, financials, et cetera. This is really product yeah. that flies away. So yes, I, you know, I helped write uh, the code for the rudder ratio changer, which if something sudden happens with the stick, the rudder waits to make sure that you in fact intended to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's software, it's yeah. software driven. In these circumstances, you know, wait for half a second rather than immediately, mm -hmm. you know, doing something. Um, um, I helped work on the systems that talk to the flight control computers. You know, I, I worked on a bunch of those things and yeah, that was my first hardcore assignment. We programmed an atlas. I had to learn something different than what I learned in school, which mm -hmm. is COBOL and Fortran. And it was a kick. It was really neat. You know, what we tried to do was simulate what an airplane would ask of these computers and then make sure that the computer did what was programmed to do. It was really fun. It was cross-functional. Actually, mm -hmm. the defense side of Boeing built the avionics for the commercial side of Boeing, so I got to move right. to defense. So on my little two-by-two two matrix, mm -hmm. I got the so color in, in defense, mm -hmm. and I got to go down here and talk about embedded software rather than just the little programs that I wrote when I was Are you always that systems. organized? No. I think this has something to do with having smart mentors. Mm -hmm. That You're never smart enough when you're starting on your career to understand where it's possible right. to go. But a mentor is always smart enough in the middle of their career, the end mm -hmm. of their career, to realize that they weren't smart enough right. and to help you sit so down and say, well, that. what are you interested in doing? Yeah. What, what would you like to be? What would be an ideal job? Mm -hmm. I was asked a really smart question from uh, a former boss. And, um, her, and her, her question kind of changed my whole idea of career planning. Her question is, what's the job you want after the next job mm -hmm. that you want? And I thought, oh! firefighting again. You know. <laughs> this is planning ahead. So 
you know, what she said was, don't be thinking about the next job, <laughs> thinking about the, the job after, after that. that, and then make sure when you have opportunities for your next job, it's something that helps you on the <laughs> next assignment. So I also built that picture, you know, being a picture person and included that in the discussions I was having and became a mentor rather than being mentored. So I was still, men by the way, my mentors are all still mentors, mm -hmm. but um, actually, you know, started to go on other folks and say, yeah. this is really kind of neat, you know. Mm -hmm. I, Phyllis asked me this great question, and how would you answer it? So, no, I didn't know what I was doing. I just was smart enough to listen to people to who knew right what people. they were doing. Yeah. Within the defense area, you, you liked working in that area. Yeah. Was it the secrecy of it that appealed to you? Well, yes. I have. There's part of my career which is a little mysterious. It looks like I was doing a computing job, and I was actually off working on a project, something to do with composites. Mm. Uh, that was really fun. Although the process of getting a security clearance is really difficult. You know, I had traveled in college around the world. I think we went to 41 countries. And the U.S. government wants to know, when did you get to the country? What did you do? And when did you leave? And they want witnesses. They want right. people that can call. Yes, in fact, you know, um, he, he went there. And, you know, they want to talk to your family and your friends and your colleagues and everything. So, but once you had a clearance, it was kind of fun to talk to other people with clearance. It's just regular people. It took some people longer to get clearances <laughs> than others, and I have no idea whether I was abnormal or not. But normally yeah, it was or normally faster normally slow. You know, there's something that happened from a computing uh, perspective. There's something that happens on a secret or top secret program, which is it has to be contained within four walls. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. if you go into a special access required area, you can't take anything in with you that you want to take out. Right. Anything you take in, you leave there. I, you have no idea what they do with that stuff. Um, and you have to have your bags checked when you come out to make sure that, you know, if you're taking anything, it's, it, you know, there's nothing, there's no data that's mm -hmm. been written on there. Well, one of the things that happens then is you get to create your own competing environment. So you get to create the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So you get, to ha you get to have the platform, you get to have the network, you get to have the workstations, the, the old days before um, standalone. You get to deal with security issues. You get to you get to see the whole thing, and I didn't plan that either. None of my mentors said you ought to mm -hmm. go and work on a right. secure program because you get educated. But it was really fun. I learned about delivery systems, the physical part of computing, on uh, programs in support of the U.S. government because there was nobody else to do it. They would only clear 35 people, and there's three computing people, and and if you were the manager that was responsible for those three people, that's four. Mm -hmm. And between the four of you, you had to do That's everything. It. Yeah. Pull cables, mm -hmm. write software. It was fun. It was mm -hmm. a kick in the pants. Now, at this job, you were a director, whereas before that, you'd been a manager. How did that differ? Well, every company has different titles, and I, I don't think, um, I don't put a lot of emphasis on titles at the Boeing company. Uh, Boeing used to have supervisors and managers, and they got away with that. They said there's managers. Uh, a, a director um, is an indication of some level of responsibility. So uh, I did not think it was a major milestone mm -hmm. when I became a director. As a matter of fact, I went from being a director to a manager again and didn't really lose any mm -hmm. status and then back to a director and didn't even notice it. Right. So... That, that other project in the middle, I believe, was that huge redesign effort. Yeah. Can you talk about that? That was an interesting wow. one. Wow. Did I get educated on that? Uh, Boeing Commercial Airplanes decided to change the way they configure airplanes. And um, the process by which you decide which parts go on an airplane. And by the way, airlines or, order uh, all different configurations of airplanes depending on how far they're going to fly. So. An airplane that flies from Seattle to London has got more space to make coffee mm -hmm. than an airplane that's going to fly from right. Seattle to St. Louis. So um, the configurations are different. And basically, the way you keep track of what parts go on a specific configuration was this you know, kind of old-fashioned process where you wrote down on the drawings the tail numbers of all the customer airplanes that those parts were going to go on. Oh, it was incredible. Mm -hmm. So the process of doing that was going to change. And we started thinking it was an engineering systems project. And then we realized that 
you know, computing people would understand, we were changing the keys for the manufacturing applications because the way that you figured out how to manufacture those was dependent upon this, this drawing, right. this tabulation that said what tail number did those parts go on. So once we started fiddling with the way we configured the airplane, it just made all these downstream changes happen. A commercial airplane did not have a MRP2 system, again, computer lingo for a factory system that orders parts as they're needed rather than orders enough parts to cover up shortages. And so we, the, the, the thing that I learned first was, even though this looked like a computing project, it was all about change right. and change is a lot harder than technology. People change. Um, people had been doing the same thing for years and they were the expert in their group. And they had green, you know, they had computer reports on green paper, but they were the expert and everybody knew if you go ask Sue, she can answer your question. And what we were going to do was take away Sue's tool and give her this mm -hmm. brand new tool that did things. Mm -hmm. And people weren't going to need to come to her anymore. No. So, so we, really, we, we, uh, we struggled, I think. And if the name of the program was Define and Control Airplane Configuration slash Manufacturing Resource Management, and that's a killer acronym, DCAC MRM. So anybody with enough patience can go to the web and find six zillion pages on DCAC MRM. The story behind the story was it was a big systems project, but it wasn't about systems. It was about changing the way you configure airplanes, which changed the engineer's job, the manufacturing engineer's job, the mechanic's job, the salesperson's job. It was really huge. And you didn't realize that ripple effect when you first started it. Well, I thought I was going over there because I'd been in defense, uh, the defense side of the business, and managed applications and I knew something about this field, uh, material resource planning. Um, I, I went over and as, as an observer, I should have been smart enough to know, you know, once you got in, if they liked you, you were You're stuck in. and you yeah. couldn't get off. Uh, so I ended up kind of being seconded in, into the project. It was a wonderful education, but what I really learned is that change is really hard and um, the the need to change has to get bigger than right. the you know the pushback. Yeah. You know, you have to reach this magical point when the incentive to change becomes greater than your than your, your inertia, your will yes. to resist the change. Yeah. And there's all sorts of fancy change models, uh, equations. But but change is real tough. So computing is is about computing. But when you get on a project where you're going to change the way people work, computing is an enabler. <laughs> it's not the change in work, right. and you really need people to know how to do the work to change. We invented a whole bunch of terms, site key users, uh, end user focals, which are business people who knew what the world was supposed to look like, who could learn what the new tools were and educate other folks. Man, we got, we found, you know, we kept finding the, the window with the bridge of our nose, you know, we kept running into these walls and it was it was a real education we were going from main this is incredible we're going from mainframe computing to distributed that would have been big enough right right there we're also going from one set of engineering processes to a different set that was kind of big enough and we were going from write your own software which is what boeing did we have 100 million lines of code that we've written ourselves to commercial off the shelf right. cot software so try you know look at the look at I mean, that's exponential. Take those three things, put them in a bucket, stir it up, and you have a real exciting, fun, educational roller coaster ride. And you just hope at the end of the ride, you know, that there's track yeah. that takes you back into the station, doesn't dump you out into Santa Cruz Bay or the something. Hinter the hinterlands. Yeah. Which sort of helped prepare you for your next role, which was the, the VP of e commerce, and that was sort of your first CIO. Type, type position, yeah. and you you actually had to recover production at one at one point. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, the job actually was the VP of Information Systems, and that was um, three years ago now. And that's a time when e-business slash e-commerce was coming into play. So my job was really to enable e-business, not to own it. Um, at the end of that two years, before I became the Boeing CIO, actually, uh, one of my bosses said, you know, we really need somebody to do e-commerce full-time. I had just transitioned to that when our CIO left and I got this new assignment. So really, that was a split mm -hmm. job. Um, 
the Vice President of Information Systems was really about computing. E-Business is really about information. So that was a really fun educational time. Um, I didn't recover production, but Boeing found themselves in a position where they couldn't deliver the airplanes they'd committed to their customers. It was really scary. And um, you know, we got a new president came in, Alan Mulally, uh, whose job was to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? We're not delivering airplanes. So one of the really fun things from a computing perspective we got to do was to deliver accurate, reliable information out of our information systems that could be used mm -hmm. to recover production. What a Jim concept. Jameson yeah. uh, actually recovered production. Well, what we found out was we had data in multiple locations, not about computing, not about doing things faster, more efficiently. It's really about looking at your multiple sources of information, figuring out what's real and then have that be the single source mm -hmm. of data. And yeah, it was a great story after we were done. It was harder than the, than the, the previous one. business process redesign mm -hmm. because we de destroyed a lot of market capitalization and we had some really frustrated customers. So once again, it was an education. The chief information officer, not the chief computing officer, and, and my job was to help figure out where the information was and get our hands on it and make it useful. So. Now you were also, this, this group was responsible for building a B2B, a business to business site that has become known as one of the 10, the 10 best B2B sites on the internet. What, what makes it so good? It was really created by the end users themselves. So the, the web as a tool, um, you know, is not that old. And um, we, we actually sell a lot of spares for airplanes. So there's 10,000 Boeing airplanes flying around the world. And at and certain intervals, you pull parts off and you put new parts on. It's fairly predictable. But um, the people who are maintaining those airplanes talk to us through electronic data interchange at night. We get these big batch uh, runs of what parts need to be where tomorrow. So we have this big engine. So actually, we had some entrepreneurs, really smart people in the spares organization that said, you know, if we had a website, our customers could actually log on mm -hmm. and see what spares were available. And if, if, we were, if we could promise to ship it in a certain amount of time, maybe they wouldn't have to have all the spares right there looking at them. Maybe the visibility of where the spares are would be of some value to them. Mm -hmm. And we ought to allow them to buy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, you know, on the web, off the web. So, um, what happened then was a team rallied around and figured out how to harden that and make that work. But it, it really was an idea of an entrepreneur. And, and most great web solutions really come from entrepreneurs. Right. But yeah, it did $400 million in business last year. That was wow. really neat. And you know, all the credit goes to those uh, people in the spares organization that said, hey, you know, let's see, spares and the web. Why don't we put the web and spares yeah. together? So now we have a bunch of really fun things like that uh, in the military business, uh, you know, where we do uh, military airplanes and and uh, missiles in the space business and the commercial business. We're trying to steal shamelessly from ourselves and look for other opportunities to sell over the web. It, as you said, it's B two B, not B two C. There's a lot of big volume business to consumer uh, folks out there. There's not that many B2B folks where you're really selling business to business. Mm -hmm. So it was fun to be in. I got educated on that one, too, because I didn't really understand the spares business very right. well. So. You then moved in and became the, the CIO of, of the Boeing company. Was that different from sort of being the CIO of just one division? Um, it was different because the Boeing company changed. Uh, Boeing company... Uh, that I grew up in was a local company selling internationally mm -hmm. and the Boeing company today includes uh, McDonnell Douglas, right. um, Rockwell, um, Hughes uh, uh, satellites. So the scope really changed, the complexity of the business changed, the core business changed. It's not just about um, airplanes with wings uh, or missiles with wings. It's about things that fly straight up and it's about uh, sea launch, which is a, a launch platform that sails out in the middle of the ocean and shoots a rocket. So the, the, it, from my perspective as a continuous learner, it was a wonderful education for me. And yeah, it was fun. Now, the mixing of all those cultures is quite a challenge too. And there's a lot of folks who have been through a number of mergers, you know, that have written real interesting books about that. That's back to the change model. Mm -hmm. um, that was fun, too. 
But each of those different uh, companies had their own culture and their own idea of how computing could work and their own way of storing data. So we've been having a real kick in the pants for the year that I've been the Boeing CIO, mm -hmm. figuring out how to make it, make it truly one company, to be able to share information up and down, meaning the programs, and across, meaning the mm -hmm. functions, engineering, operations, et cetera. Can you tell us about the day in the life of a CIO? Well, um, today I'm here with you at the Thank University you. of Washington. <laughs> um, I'm the vice chair of the Seattle Chamber of Commerce. That's what I, where I did with my lunch today. Um, I started this morning on a net meeting with uh, computing folks around the company, around the globe, actually. So um, every day is different, but basically we have hundreds of offices around the world. We design parts in Moscow, two blocks off of the Kremlin in the McDonald's building. And then those parts are shipped while we're sleeping. And then people, engineers, pick them up in Seattle and design while the folks in Moscow are sleeping and ship them back. So it's kind of a 7 by 24 job. Uh, part of my job is, is external. You know, a colleague here at the um, uh, School of Business uh, as part of the eBiz program. Part of my job is internal in terms of looking for ways to handle data the same and trying to develop standards. Mm -hmm. um, um, and it's, it's really fun because it's not the same every, every day. day. You do a lot of work with vendors. Is that difficult or do you enjoy those interactions? IT vendors? Yeah. Oh, that's fun. What's interesting is that, um, that we have a number of really good IT vendors who are developing products that other really good IT vendors are also developing. It's one of the interesting things, you know, ERP was the buzzword of the 90s. Mm -hmm. So we found, I won't name vendors, but we found that the people that we had picked were growing their product suite into areas that other people that we had picked were also growing them. So this is, re this is the real fun part about being a CIO, which is um, whatever you pick is gonna change over time, and it's gonna change based on where the market is going. And if you're really smart, you can always get best in class mm -hmm. from the market, especially if you don't build everything yourself, right. which we stopped doing that. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that you want to have good long-term relationships, and yet the products are changing so fast. I mean, an internet, you know, internet time, um, you know, a year is like a month. Right. So the world is, is changing real fast. Product cycles of two years or two, three months. Your projects get chunked up smaller. Uh, we're working more in partnerships with our IT suppliers, so we don't even call them suppliers, we call them partners. Mm -hmm. um, and yet the fun part is that they, everybody's going after the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, CRM is big now, customer relationship management, so the, the ERP folks are getting into CRM. Um, it's a real and education. CRM folks are getting into ERP, they're all Well, you know, people shift. are building exchanges, e each of the verticals, meaning automotive, aerospace, banking, chemicals are looking at how they can, how the companies can work across the enterprise. We're working with our, our sometimes partners, sometimes competitors. We're collaborating with them and we're working with IT partners, which sometimes are our partners and sometimes aren't. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's a fun world. It's yeah. a blast. Yeah, I get in the morning early and, you know, get calls from people and say, Did, you know, do you know what you've done today? And I say, no, I haven't done anything yet. You know, I've had a cup of coffee. And, so it's fun. It's, it's part of the assignment. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a world where you can pick one IT, my opinion, you can't pick one IT vendor that will supply all of your needs. How would you describe your management style? Well, um, my personality style uh, is um, I'm expressive. You know, I like to think out loud. Um, I'm intuitive rather than sensing, so I'm kind of a picture person. I like to start with the top picture and move down rather than start with the details and move up. Um, and so that affects my management style. I didn't know that originally. My initial idea of management was that the manager was the person who was smart enough to, to let people know what they should be doing during the day. I have a completely opposite view of management now, which is a manager's job is to be able to talk to people across multiple functions and listen really well and, and get people together that might not naturally go together, build teams. Um, 
I don't always live like that, but that's really my philosophy, which is uh, a manager's job is to remove barriers, not to give direction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's tempting in the heat of the battle when you're firefighting, and no matter how much planning you do, you still have fires, so you still gotta go out on the line, even if you've had good preparation. Sometimes your tendency is to say, okay, listen, the debate's over, this is the way it's gonna be. You know, I, I try not to do that too much, I find myself doing that. What's my management style? You know, I believe I can learn something from anybody I run into during the day. What frustrates you? Well, I'm a top-down person, so I like to know how big the lawn is before I start cutting it. Um, and um, what, what frustrates me is that I can't always communicate with a bottoms-up person. Mm -hmm. So there's sometimes a gap. Some people will cut the same strip of lawn over and over, but they're happy because they're cutting. And some people never start cutting because they're top down and they want to make sure they're covering everything. So um, I like to be a better communicator than I am. I, I try to be a good communicator. And one of the hooks is, I mean, you've got to have these brilliant people who have the bottoms up view. Like I said, you really want to connect the multiple views of the bottom together. And to do that, it's top down. And I, I find myself not being able to see a solution sometimes that frustrates mm -hmm. me. Uh, but I'm kind of a, you know, I would hope I'm a continuous learner where there's always something to learn. So I don't get frustrated really easy. I do get frustrated occasionally. Were you ever tempted to leave Boeing? Sure, yeah. I think anyone that said they weren't tempted to leave Boeing or any large company would probably be making that up. Mm -hmm. And you have to question their management style then. Um, one of the reasons I haven't left is because a big company like Boeing gives you so many opportunities that you can get different opportunities and not leave. But um, Fortune 50 CIOs are on everybody's call list. Mm -hmm. And so I get calls all the time. And my office administrator just does a wonderful job of deciding you know, who's calling on business and who's trying mm -hmm. to recruit. Um, I'm, I'm not really interested in leaving. I, I'm kind of on this journey. Now, if I stop learning, uh, you know, that's it. I'm gone. And there have been a couple times where I wondered, you know, I've been in this job for a couple of years. This is scary, but a couple of years. And I wonder what I'm, you know, what's the next thing? But having a long-term plan, I've never really been in serious doubt about Boeing being a great place to work. But yeah, sure. Every once in a while, you know, you think, I wonder what, what else I could be doing out there. Well, you said that one of, your, one of your mentors told you not to just look at the next job, but look at the job after that. Sure. What are your next two jobs? Well, um, there's no place else to go in computing. So um, I would really like to be involved in one of the new product areas that Boeing is involved in. We have some really fun stuff going on. One of our core competencies is large-scale systems integration. So that's not writing code, but that is taking big, complex problems and figuring out how to solve them. So I'm an architect. I like to look from the top and see how things could be put together. So there's two really fun areas I'd love to be involved. One of them is called Connection by Boeing, which is basically putting broadband onto an airplane. Mm -hmm. allowing people to watch any movie that was ever made or to connect to their email or to do all sorts of fun stuff from an airplane, all that productive time. The other one is air traffic management, which figured out how to get the world's air traffic systems, which are really separate oh, systems, yeah. you know, to talk to each other. That's so, a big one. Now, um, you know, um, all of anything that I might do at Boeing from here on out will involve technology in some way, I don't, I think. You know, I don't think I'm going to, the job after next is going to be something where I, I have nothing to do with technology. Mm -hmm. But our products are changing so smart. You know, we have um, uh, computers every place. We have chips yeah. in everything. You know, we have smart, I saw a smart refrigerator in Europe a couple of weeks ago where when you remove the last beer, it reorders. <laughs> that was really cool. So, you know, here's a refrigerator uh, you know, manufacturer, and there's some person like me that mm -hmm. said, you know what, mm -hmm. really be neat. We get homegrocer.com, right. you know, to, to bring the beer. Actually, you'd want it to be the second to the last beer, probably, realistically, because <laughs> by the time you get to the last it's, beer, it's too late. Home grocer yeah. doesn't can't even get it on the truck in time for you to go, hey, I'm out of beer. 
So uh, I see my next job and my job after to help figure out how to use technology to transform the way we do business, not just in, in, in history, computing was used to do things faster, more efficiently, less errors. In the future, information technology will help us do things differently, create new business models, invent value, not just mm -hmm. add value. So I'm juiced. It's a, I mean, aerospace is a great industry to be involved in because they've been using information technology mm -hmm. for years, design the airplanes in a computer. Right. That was neat. That was early 90s. You know, that's not today. Feels we did forever that. ago. Yeah, yeah, right. I know that your job requires a lot of travel. I know this firsthand because every time I try and set up a phone call with you, you're either on the way to the airport or coming right. from the airport. How do you balance that with your family commitments? Well, my family is number one priority, and my job is someplace, you know, <laughs> number two. Um, it's tough. I have three kids, and um, it's, it's interesting. In my job, I couldn't stay in Seattle. It's not a local company anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have large numbers of people in, in computing in Southern California. We're a big employer there, St. Louis, Wichita, Huntsville. Uh, the Cape, um, Seattle, obviously. So if, even if I just spent my time working with the computing folks, that'd be great. We have computing suppliers in Paris and uh, Dublin and Moscow. Um, my family's really understanding of that it requires some travel. Uh, sometimes I wish I was around more, though. So I have a 10-year-old son, played football. Uh, I missed one of his games. And I felt terrible. I was in Moscow, so I you know, stayed over a weekend. So I guess I sit down with my cal calendar and I figure out how, what am I going to be at this month. And then my 16-year-old daughter tells me that I never tell her when I'm going places. Um, I'm going to the East Coast uh, tomorrow. So I told my daughter last night, you know, look me square in the eye. I'm going to the East Coast. <laughs> um, I just try to do the best I I can. I think my kids know that they come above my, my job. What if you could be far away and still be close to everyone and everything that's important to you? If you could talk to anyone in your family the instant you thought about them. or have a meeting with foreign business associates like you were in the same room? What if you could have the information you need come to you when you wanted it? And you had the power to make all the pieces of your life come together more than you ever imagined? Welcome to the future of wireless from AT&T. Your universe is getting smaller, and staying at the center of it just keeps getting easier. Wireless from AT&T. Your world close at hand. With Boeing involved with the B2B exchange in the last couple of years, uh, yeah. it seems like that's their big way of getting involved with the internet. How do you see the Ch Boeing's involvement with the internet and that interaction between it in the next five, ten years? That's a big question. Um, let me try to have a short answer to the big uh, question. Um, the internet is really a tool. It's a physical thing and if used correctly, can change the business model. So we see a local company, Amazon, who intimately knows me. You know, when I, when I log on, I was reading a lot of books on the Civil War. I got a note back that said, what's the matter with the Revolutionary War? It was big, it happened in the same country, and we think you ought to look into it. That's intimate customer knowledge. Did the internet enable that? No. Amazon figured out that knowledge of a customer is really important, and if they watched to see where a customer was looking, and, and recorded where they were buying and were able to analyze, mine the data, they could do something radically different. I, I don't know that the internet changes the world, but the ability to take my laptop and go to Russia and work, you know, <laughs> um, it, it, it basically running over the internet in, with encryption and decryption is radical. That's a different business model. I think wireless will change the world more than the internet as we know it, which is, you know, a physical thing. Uh, because wireless has the ability to change the way we drive our cars, we navigate the way to work. Wireless has the ability to have your car, when it gets in with proximity of Starbucks, 
to have the double tall extra hot latte, no whip. You know, have somebody handing it out the door so you can swoosh by. What are maybe some or maybe one or two of the most important traits that someone would like to develop as a college graduate? That's great. Most important trait, my opinion, take it, you know, for what it's worth, is the ability to work on a cross-functional team, which means you cannot just speak marketing or accounting or e-business. You have to be able to work with an engineer, a manufacturing person. Manufacturing people speak their own language. Um, a, a computer scientist, an architect. I think the number one thing is get on some teams where you're building something with people outside of your discipline. That is so critical. I spend most of my life with people outside of my discipline because I'm looking to provide information technology to real problems and real people have real problems. Computing people help provide solutions. So I, that's the number one thing. Number two, I, I, mean, I, I think if you can get cross-functional, if you're in the business program, it, take some technology. If you're in technology, take some business. This is what my career has been. The University of Washington Business School, located in Seattle, Washington, ranks among the top business schools in the United States. Information technology leaders is one of the many ways the UW Business School forges partnerships and reaches out beyond the university. For more information about the University of Washington Business School or information technology leaders, visit informationtechnologyleaders.com. What if you could be far away and still be close to everyone and everything that's important to you? If you could talk to anyone in your family the instant you thought about them? If you could have the information you need come to you when you wanted it? And you had the power to make all the pieces of your life come together more than you ever imagined? Welcome to the future. Wireless from AT&T. Your world, close at hand. I'd like to close with a composite quote from a number of people we spoke with. My first impression of Scott was that he was a real business guy. He understood what Boeing was trying to do and could see how technology could both enable and drive the necessary changes. One of the skills that's in the shortest supply right now is vision, the ability to look out into the future, see where a company can go, and know which technologies will matter. Scott has an admirably long field of vision. But that alone won't make you or your company successful. You need to recognize the importance of partnering, and that's another area where Scott excels. He effectively partners with his business colleagues, his staff, his vendors, and his community. He's a great communicator who listens and can always talk at the right level. He truly invests in networking, and that investment has significantly led to his success. How rare to find someone with vision and people skills, and then I would certainly add clarity. How rare indeed. Thank wow. you very much. That's nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.